everyone. Uh, my name is Yin Li. I'm a first year postdoc fellow at EI. I'm going to present uh, an example of assessing the co-benefit of greenhouse gas reduction in developing countries. Uh, the public health benefits of in-use vehicle inspection and maintenance programs in Bangkok, Thailand. This uh, study is one piece of my PhD dissertation. Here's some uh, background information of this study. Urban air pollution associated with transportation is currently a major public health concern in many large developing metropolitan areas because the uh, rapid in increase in vehicle use in these areas. And scientific studies has linked exposure to transportation emissions to adverse health effects. Policies uh, aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions often find weak support in developing countries because of the need for economic development uh, in these countries. But uh, the policy will gain in support as the co-benefits of greenhouse gas reductions are included in financial analysis. A major co-benefit of greenhouse gas uh, reduction is, the, is reduced emissions of particulate matter, result in improved health and uh, economic performance. Bank, the capital city of Thailand, Bangkok, uh, is a large developing metropolitan area. The population in the city is about 10 million. At present, a key sustainable issue uh, in Bangkok is ambient particulate matter pollution. Since the 1990s, Daily concentrations of particularly PM10 frequently exceeded the uh, standard recommended by the World Health Organization to protect the public health. Uh, sometimes it reached two to three times higher than the standard. The main source, sources of particulate matter in Bangkok are diesel fueled vehicles and uh, motorcycles. These uh, vehicles are widely used in the city and many of them are poorly maintained. The consequences of, uh, the consequence of particulate matter pollution is serious uh, health damage and uh, huge economic loss. So the purpose of this study is to quantify the health benefit potentially achieved by specific uh, transportation emission control policies. So we could improve the understanding the, of the link between specific control policies and the associated health benefits in Thailand. The health benefits serve as the co-benefits of greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, so two policy scenarios are considered in this study business as usual, and a hypothetical abatement policy scenario, uh, which is implementing a new inspection and maintenance programs ta targeting particulate matter emissions from in-use diesel-fueled vehicles and uh, motorcycles. These uh, inspection and maintenance programs are different from uh, traditional inspection and maintenance programs because uh, they inspect particulate matter emissions from vehicles Traditional uh, inspection and maintenance programs uh, inspect other pollutants uh, from gasoline-fueled vehicles. The base year of study is the year 2000, when uh, a lot of quality uh, air monitoring data, air quality monitoring data, became available. Uh, to conduct health benefit analysis, this study used uh, an integrated framework. This framework combines policy analysis, exposure assessment, exposure response assessment, and uh, economic valuation. Now let's look at what happened in the city of Bangkok over time with or without the inspection and the maintenance programs. Under the business as usual scenario, it is expected uh, the number of vehicles in the city will increase rapidly as a result of uh, rapid economic development. Empirical uh, data from the past decade show the uh, an average annual vehicle growth rate in Bangkok is 6.2% compared to the uh, average annual growth rate between 1 to 2% here uh, in the US. 
uh, the fleet average emission rates uh, are likely to decrease even if without any control policy because uh, the newer vehicles have a better emission performance than the older vehicles. Also, uh, population are expected to grow uh, in the city as a result of urbanization. The Bangkok data show the population, annual average population growth rate is about 1%. Under the inspection and maintenance program scenario, the programs target a 25% decrease in the fleet average emission rate compared to the business as usual scenario. Also, uh, the programs are likely to slow down the growth in the number of vehicles because uh, tighter regulations may stop people's decision to buy vehicles. Here's the uh, method used in health benefit analysis. Uh, human exposure assessment. This study used the uh, monitor the ambient the PM10 concentration data to represent human exposure to uh, particulate matter pollution. Health endpoints based on uh, existing epidemiology literature, uh, mortality and various morbidity uh, were considered uh, in, in calculating the health effect of particulate matter. Examples of morbi morbidity, chronic bronchitis, respiratory hospital admissions, uh, cardiovascular hospital admissions, and others. Uh, the, the concentration response coefficients that link the ambient concentration of PM to health effect were abstracted from epidemiology literature. The priority, the priority is to use studies conducted in Thailand or similar uh, regions. Finally, uh, willingness to pay data was were used to uh, calculate the dollar value of health effects of uh, particulate matter exposure. The key results. Uh, in the base year 2000, uh, in the city of Bangkok, exposure to particulate matter emissions from motor vehicles caused about 1,700 deaths and thousands of cases of illness. The total uh, health damage caused in that year were $2.7 billion, which equal to about 2.4% uh, of Thailand's GDP in that year. Uh, deaths and the illness both accounted for about half of the health damage in terms of uh, economic value. This graph shows the projection of total particulate matter emissions from motor vehicles in Bangkok. The, uh, the blue line is the business as usual scenario and the pink line is the uh, inspection and maintenance scenario. So uh, we can see without uh, any control policies, the business as usual scenario, the total emissions from vehicles in Bangkok will increase fast. It's about 20,000 20, uh, tons in 2008 will reach more than uh, 30,000 tons in the year 2015. The inspection maintenance program will uh, reduce PM emissions from vehicles, reduce about 5,000 tons every year. That's the difference between the two lines. Accordingly, uh, the health damage due to exposure to particulate matter emissions will uh, increase fast over time. Uh, the, the same, uh, the blue line is the business as usual scenario and uh, pink line is the inspection and maintenance scenario. So the difference between these two lines are the health uh, benefit of the inspection and maintenance programs, which is about a uh, thousand million dollars every year. This study also uh, estimated the cost of implementing the inspection and maintenance programs. The components of the cost include uh, a startup cost, such as equipment and land use, operating and maintenance costs, and also violating uh, vehicle repair costs. 
So this study estimated the total annual cost of uh, in implementing inspection and maintenance programs in Bangkok to be about $140 million. So the total annual health benefit of the programs is much greater than the cost of the programs. In concluding, uh, the new inspection maintenance programs in Bangkok targeting diesel fueled vehicles and motorcycles could generate substantial public health benefit relative to the business as usual scenario due to avoid the death and the illness. These benefits serve as the co-benefits of greenhouse gas control strategies. And also the, in the programs will produce health benefits whose economic impacts consider, considerably outweigh the expenditures on policy implementation. Uh, so for my two years fellowship here, I'm going to examine the co-benefit of greenhouse gas control in another developing country, which is uh, my home country, China. Thank you. Last presentation, and it looked like the oh, she's right behind me. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see it. There, the you had a figure where it looked like the the last um, figure was a business as usual, and then versus the implementation and maintenance, and it looked like the trajectory of the two lines was exactly the same. The only thing that was different was the starting point. And I was wondering if you could just explain what was going on there. Looks like the, the they don't seem to diverge. yeah they don't diverge the trajectory or the the slope of the line looks like th the same, it's just that the starting point is different and so I guess my my question is, what what can account for the trajectory being the same and and is there really a big difference? It just if you just sort of are theorizing that if you start at a different point, you know the line is going the same direction. So what can you just explain what's happening? Actually, they do diverge. Okay. It's not much. But it's not yeah. much, and I guess I'm just sort of curious if you can explain what's going on there. It, it, it does, but I think if I make uh, make a gr uh, bigger that starting from uh, three thousand and end and <laughs> four thousand, it you will see the difference. It does. Right. <laughs> yeah, it does, but in this graph, yeah, it's 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 not easy to see the difference, but my numbers. Uh, Uh, I think briefly is uh, the case is uh, in both scenario, the uh, the total emissions per vehicle will increase as a result of a relative increase in in, in a metropolitan in a developing metropolitan mm -hmm. area. But uh, with the policy, if we increase uh, relatively slowly, it can be really extreme. Well, but but why is it that you start at a lower spot? We started a lower, the total annual health damages are lower just initially. Why wouldn't they be, we, why would we assume that they would be, is that because you have uh, 2,000 is like way back here? Because you started at 2,000, right? So Yes, the, these are my projection years. Uh, mm. My base year is 2,000. And uh, this work, uh, the initial work was completed in 2008. So that's why mm, I, oh, okay. I so provided in the projection starting from so if you if we we went back in time to 2000, they would be at one point, and then they went this way. Yes, and the uh, policy uh, assumed to start in 2008. Okay, thank you. That makes it much cl more clear. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry for the confusion. So I had a question. 
question for Andrew. Did you not have life expectancy data? Uh, you, didn't, you, you didn't show it. No, no, I didn't show it. And the reason is just uh, the, the 2010 census data is slowly trickling out. And uh, um, I don't have, there's, in the, in the 2000 census, you can calculate life expectancy from the, the census data that's there, yeah. but it's not, it's just not available on the, in the database yet. It's worth looking at particularly male, female life expectancy. Too. Yeah, de definitely, that's a, a good thing to look. Oh, no, that, that's a good suggestion. That was good things to look at. Thank you. Um, can I ask, for heat wave mortality, isn't age the biggest vulnerability factor? I that mean, in, in all the big heat waves where there's been significant mortality, it's predominantly elderly people living on their own. Yeah. Um, and at a lower socioeconomic character stage, but in the U.S., the numbers have always been small. I mean, the sample size is small. In terms of uh, total the total number? Yeah. yeah, well, I think w one thing interesting, um, and actually I was just um, talking to somebody else about this today up at the School of Public Health, is that um, a lot of the deaths sort of classified as due to a heat wave, um, it's, it's a much smaller, um, number than when like epidemiology studies are done looking at kind of like a time series study or a case crossover design and actually when you look at total non-accidental deaths that are um, can be linked to that heat wave because I you know which would be include cardiovascular deaths and right. other causes so of death. It's exacerbation of previous conditions um, you have to argue are included in that rather than heat stroke. Yeah, exactly. It's not just heat stroke, so it might be a heart attack um, or something else, or which right, right. So it's hard to know what to include. Yeah, so it's it's not so so generally we're we're going to be looking at all cause mortality, all non accidental cause mortality, and linking it specifically to that day or if you look at the excess mortality. Right. If we did it for the Chicago heat Yeah, um, I think there was a Kaiser. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, and age is, is definitely one of those factors that's out there in the literature, but there's um, there's papers that's, that find that and don't, um, and then there's also these other um, characteristics. And I think one of the things that I'm specifically interested in is um, built environment um, type of things, because it's something we can do something about. Um, and there's a lot of good New York City data in, in that area. People are going to be filtering in. I think we have Jeff till five o'clock, so I'd like to get us started with uh, Daniel, the first talk of the uh, of the next session. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Daniel Soto. I want to apologize in advance. I'm a little under the weather, so if I cough into this microphone, please forgive me. Um, I'm affiliated uh, most closely with Vijay Modi's lab. Vijay works on infrastructure uh, in the Millennium Villages. Broadly, what I'm talking to you today is about electricity services, the delivery in to environments like the Millennium Village, um, some of the strategies we've taken so far, 
and um, some of the ways that I think that this work could continue in the future. So I'm one part of a very large team that works on this stuff. Um, we have multiple sites across uh, the Millennium Villages, so it's really a large effort. I want to start by reminding folks of the kind of things that people use to get their uh, energy services in the developing world currently. You can kind of break this into two categories, basically fossil fuels and effort. So people burn kerosene in order to create light. They uh, have petrol generators to charge cell phones. They also simply carry around the goods and services they need, um, actually manually lifting water and irrigating and then bringing back and forth large rechargeable batteries on motorcycles or by hand to areas that have grid connections. So these services are so in demand that people are going through this sort of inconvenience and expense to gain them, to gain light, to gain communication. So we looked at this and we kind of identified two sort of key problems if you want to deliver a more convenient form of electricity. One is that if you look at fossil fuel, it's mature, it's pretty simple to bring in generators, but there's a high recurring cost, and then that cost is often has volatility associated with it. Now, renewable energy has close to zero recurring costs, but the, co the capital costs are very high. Even in the United States, it's sort of hard for us to afford solar panels on our roofs. So we were looking for less of a technology solution and more of a business model that would allow us to transfer the, the upfront cost from the, the end consumer to some sort of entity that would provide power in some sort of energy service agreement. So we came up with a, <clears throat> a solution basically to provide a prepaid microgrid utility that would lower the upfront cost to the user and use the sort of pay-as-you-go model that had been successful in the proliferation of cell phones. Um, we thought there were some other benefits such as lower maintenance costs through automation, um, reducing unnecessary trips to sites that are really difficult to get to. You could, we um, are using solar electricity in this, but really we were trying to, to have a, a business model that you could use for any source of electricity. And again, the, the vision is to create an opportunity for some sort of private enterprise to take off and be able to deliver electricity profitably in these areas. The private market is already responsible for the kerosene and the battery charging. So if you could just do that in a way that brings a sort of cleaner, more convenient source to people, we thought that would be a benefit. The way we did that was um, basically to create small solar microgrids. So this is a picture of one of them in Uganda. What you're looking at is a uh, is a small shed um, the, with solar panels on top. And then you see a little bit of dug up earth where there have been trenches dug in order to bring wires out to other homes. So basically you have a, a centralized facility for generation and then you're distributing power out to multiple homes. What's inside that shed um, is that you've got the array of so connected solar panels. Um, they're coming into the interior of the shed. Is this going to let me down? Yes. Um, there's a small uh, area where you can see the, uh, the cables coming in. There's a huge battery bank. Um, there's a couple of uh, pieces of electronics for the solar electronics. And then the main crux of uh, what we've done is in a, a gray box on the right edge of this photo. Uh, which is shown in detail and open in another installation on the next photo. So basically this box has all the technological pieces in place to provide this kind of prepaid um, electricity. What that is is a cell phone modem to communicate with the outside world, a computer to provide accounting for the entire system, and then a couple of uh, the beige boxes are a commercially available off-the-shelf meter that allows us to meter the electricity going to each home and then um, a switch that allows us to, um, to turn off that electricity based on whether or not the consumer has a balance. So in terms of what that sort of consumer experience looks like, it's much like the way they pay for airtime on a cell phone. Um, we've provided scratch cards that we've printed ourselves. 
um, people are able to, to enter the codes from those scratch cards into a cell phone. The message is sent for all intents and purposes to the shed where the computer inside intercepts it and then is able to credit a household depicted uh, schematically with a certain amount of electricity and then energize their wire uh, so that they can use that. So what do they use this power for? They use it um, largely for lighting um, to help uh, just with tasks. Um, some folks are also using it for entertainment and communication purposes. And what we've seen is that in this particular case, and as we go forward, we'll be able to see more data and more evidence of this, um, that people are actually going out and buying um, appliances um, now that they have this amount of power. So the, we just have anecdotes right now, but hopefully in the spring we can create you know, a little bit of a story showing you these trends. I wish that they had more efficient televisions available in the marketplaces. This is a little bit of an energy hog. But it's, it's interesting to see both um, the sort of stimulated demand and then um, the, the products that are coming into this niche um, to allow people to consume this electricity in ways that bring them value. How much energy would that draw? This is around a, a sort of 100 watt TV. So, you know, a couple of, um, as opposed to, I think a, even a, a power hungry laptop is on the order of 20 to 50. So it's, it's well beyond what it needs to be. I assume that a, a small sort of DVD airplane type player is probably on the order of 10 watts. So these products are emerging, but a lot of this stuff is the sort of secondhand market, the same place they get cast off automobile batteries and things like this. Um, so as for the scope, we've got a pretty ambitious scope. So far there's, there's eight systems in Mali delivering power to over 2,000 people. Um, we have plans for eight systems in Tanzania, and then four systems are in Uganda with um, plans to install four more. So what's great is that, and what I haven't told you is that on the other side of, of, of the ocean really, from all of these solar panels, is a server where we're able to collect the data on consumption and on power usage uh, that, these, um, that these households are consuming. That's going to allow us to, to, along with survey data, to look at behavior patterns, even perhaps what predicts a certain level of power consumption um, in terms of wealth, educational status, who knows. Um, I hope to come back in the spring with some interesting correlations and stories about what we're finding. But this visualization tool lets you see things like over the course of one month, um, this particular site has actually increased their overall power usage by about 20 to 25 percent. So then you can go back and say, is that actually consumers consuming more, or is there some parasitic in the system that's squandering this power? What's going on? So having this sort of power, I mean, this sort of visualization capability at a desk so that you can intelligently dispatch your resources to fix these, um, the inevitable maintenance problems that you're going to have is, we think, useful. So what we're finding, and I'll talk a little bit about cost in the future, is that it's expensive to deploy these systems. But what we're finding is that customers are willing to pay a surprising premium for the convenience and the flexible, flexibility of this power source. We've chosen a price so that it's on par, so that their monthly expenditures will be on par with what they were spending on their conventional um, sources, kerosene, cell phone charging, but at the same time delivering you know, on the order of 10 to 40 times more light. So cost the same, but the service a, a large increase. Again, we're trying to develop tools for entrepreneurs and to, to engage with folks that might be able to do this um, at scale. We've certainly determined that cooperation with the cell phone network providers is key to get um, reliable access to these data streams. It's amazing what we can do in places that sort of like internet does not exist. But these networks are also brittle, so cooperation with these kind of large-scale entities is important. And then one thing that we think is really exciting is that I can tell you whether or not the initial investment is actually leading to power today, yesterday, or the week before in these places. So this kind of transparency we think is really important. I want to talk briefly about um, 
the kind of cost that this takes to do. So if we assume sort of 200 watt hours per day, that's a couple of light bulbs running for a while, um, definitely able to charge some cell phones, watch some TV uh, for a couple hours a day if you have a more efficient one. For this sort of power, really rough numbers, the solar panels are on the order of 100 US dollars, the batteries are on the order of 100 US dollars, the electronics to sort of get um, power from the solar panels into the batteries on the order of 50 bucks. Wiring is, is really a wild card depending on the sort of environment you're in, the density of the houses, and whether or not you're trying to, to, to create a, a mini grid of many homes or just single homes. But then the metering electronics actually is really a, a small, at scale, um, is a small addition to this. So the, the places to really focus on are the sort of the solar panels, the battery, and the wiring. And these costs are common to any electrification strategy. Um, so one thing that makes me optimistic is that there's a couple of trends in the developing world that I think where those um, technological advances we can just immediately incorporate into our efforts to bring things to the developing world. So one of those is that the photovoltaic market continues to expand. People continue to learn how to make these panels um, cheaper and more efficiently with higher efficiency. So it's, it's the, the $1 a watt sort of price point has been predicted for a long time and then it's, it's open to discussion whether or not we've reached it today or if we've reached it in a couple of years from now, but it continues to drop, that's exciting. The other part that's interesting is the electric vehicle market. I showed you that enormous battery bank. This is literally a thousand pound battery. Um, but that battery is a, about the same scale as the, in terms of the power delivered and the, the energy delivered of, a, of an electric car battery. So the, the electric car market is grappling with the exact same sort of feature set that we would like for this sort of thing. You want a compact, light, easy to transport, robust battery. And we've seen um, the technology go from the, the large established lead acid batteries, which we actually have because they are the workhorse battery, but you're seeing in the Nissan Leaf, you're starting to see in the Prius, and you're seeing in the Chevy Volt, and then famously in the, the Tesla, lithium ion batteries. So another technology and an entire enormous market driving down costs and trying to create technological inf innovation that we can just sort of import into these areas. So that, that's one piece where I think, where I'm optimistic on a sort of five and 10 year time frame that we'll be able to reduce some of these costs. So I was trying to keep it down to 10. Uh, so thank you and I'll take questions after everyone else is done. Just a second here. Oh man, come on now. There we go. All right, great. All right, my name is James Tamarius. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about my doctoral uh, research a little bit. I'm a first year postdoc here at the Earth Institute. Um, um, and also be going to talk about my current and future projects here at the Earth Institute. Um, but like I said, uh, most of this uh, presentation is mostly going to be about my doctoral research on climate predictors of influenza across um, the globe, uh, and that's including temperate and tropical populations. Um, so first off, uh, influenza infects uh, approximately 12 to 15 percent of the population every year, kills approximately 500,000 to 1 million people per year. Um, it's transmitted through aerosol. Uh, droplet and direct contact. Um, and one of the most striking characteristics of the disease is its, uh, at least at a population scale, is its uh, consistent seasonality, especially in temperate regions. So this plot here is looking at um, pneumonia and influenza mortality for uh, three different countries, France, United States, and Australia, um, for about 30 years. Um, and what you'll see there is consistent wintertime epidemics. So France and United States being in the same hemisphere, they're in phase, whereas Australia is about six months out of phase. So Australia sees it during their winter or our summer. 
And so uh, one of the, the, the questions, um, one of the primary questions I was looking at um, during my research, my doctoral research, was what causes this uh, seasonality? Um, and um, a paper came out while I was just starting this uh, by Dr. Uh, Jeff Shaman, who's now here at um, Environmental Health Sciences um, at the Mailman Public, uh, School of Public Health. And basically, it was showing a relationship between absolute humidity and influenza virus survival. And what it shows is that there's an inverse relationship between absolute humidity, and just for uh, clarification for those of you who don't know, absolute humidity is a measure of the uh, mass of water vapor in the air um, relative or in, in a volume. It's uh, very different than relative humidity. Um, but basically, uh, what he showed was using data from previous studies um, that virus survival, uh, absolute humidity is the best predictor of virus survival in the environment. So when we sneeze or cough and we're infected, in, uh, influenza viruses go out into the environment, and if the absolute humidity is lower, that viruses were, will survive better and increase uh, or enhance the uh, efficiency of transmission. So in the, uh, the second figure there, you actually see uh, the efficiency of transmission between model hosts, uh, which in this case were guinea pigs, as a specific humidity decreases in a laboratory setting. And so it's thought that this uh, mechanism can explain why we see influenza during the winter in temperate regions. So um, one thing I was curious about looking at was uh, to, to see if this observation and this relationship was consistent with what we see in the tropics. Um, and so just to give you an idea a little bit about what goes on in the tropics. So first off, these are two temperate regions down here, Bismarck, North Dakota, and Sydney, Australia. And these are the number of uh, influenza viruses over the uh, course of a year that are detected. Actually, this is aggregated over several years. And you'll see that it occurs uh, primarily in the winter in these temperate regions. The other two locations are Fortaleza, Brazil, and Singapore. Um, and you'll see up in the top right corner is Singapore that you see year-round transmission of the viruses. Um, and in the bottom left-hand corner, you see, uh, again, a striking seasonality to influenza in Fortaleza. So my question was, well, why do we see these different patterns? And is it consistent with what we see in temperate regions? So the short answer is no. That specific humidity, um, the relationship between specific humidity and influenza epidemics is actually opposite um, in uh, the tropics. So in the temperate regions, such as New York, uh, we have influenza epidemics when specific humidity or absolute humidity is uh, the lowest time, which is winter. And in the tropics, you see it during the most humid time of the year. And as I explored this a little more, I found instead of this monotonic relationship that was shown in the Shaman et al. Um, uh, uh, paper, I found a U-shaped relationship between absolute humidity and the probability of influenza. And uh, not only this, but I was also able to find that uh, the range of absolute humidity for any given location, you can start predicting the timing of influenza epidemics or the, 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 the average timing of epidemics, seasonal epidem epidemics, uh, based on the range of uh, absolute humidity for any location. And this is just a map using that model I created. The green areas showing places that should have a uh, peak during the warm, warmest and most humid season, and the blue locations having uh, influenza epidemics during their winters. Um, so next I wanted to uh, apply this to uh, pandemic influenza. So that, what I showed you previously was epidemic influenza. Those are the ones we have consistently every single year. And I wanted to look at uh, pandemic influenza, and um, luckily or unluckily, depending on how you look at it, we had one in 2009. Uh, it was actually a, a fairly uh, mild pandemic. We look at it as unlucky. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it was mild, so yeah. <laughs> um, well, there were three waves uh, in Mexico, so I got some data from Mexico. P&I mortality there on the y-axis, that's the pneumonia and influenza mortality. It's a good proxy for uh, influenza activity. 
And um, basically, uh, there were three waves. Um, the first wave was just in a couple states. That's probably where uh, the pandemic first uh, jumped from uh, swine into humans. Um, and then we had a summer wave in the southern part of Mexico, which is the most tropical part of Mexico, and then a fall wave in northern, more temperate area of Mexico. So I wanted to see if my U-shaped relationship could maybe explain this. So I used a dynamical model called SEIR model, S-E-I-R -E model, which is commonly used for uh, infectious disease, uh, communicable disease, because it, uh, it basically accounts for the factor that you are losing susceptibles as the, uh, as the epidemic uh, progresses. And I was basically able to uh, model the structure, the spatiotemporal structure of these waves and the timing of these waves across Mexico. So there on the top row there, you have the summer wave. Um, on the left column is the normalized PNI or the observations. And on the right side, you have the modeled um, PNI or the modeled influenza activity. And you can see that you see uh, increased influenza activity in the uh, tropical areas of Mexico. And then in, down on the uh, lower row there in the fall, you see uh, also a consistent uh, spatial structure with the model and the observed. So giving some sort of uh, corroborating, maybe the model is telling us not only something about epidemic influenza, but as well as pandemic influenza, it may be able to help us predict the timing and um, uh, the spatiotemporal timing of waves in the future for pandemics. Okay, so um, that was just a quick shot of uh, my doctoral research. Um, and now I, I wanna talk about my uh, current and future research here at uh, Earth Institute. So one thing I'm trying to do right now is trying to get some, um, some, some funding to uh, do a pilot program here, or a little pilot study, um, is actually to do an environmental sampling of respiratory pathogens in uh, New York City public spaces. Um, and basically go into public spaces and also monitor the environment at the same time. So monitoring temperature and humidity. And um, we're gonna use PCR to test for RNA of the virus and also hopefully be able to uh, culture viable virus. And the ratio between this will tell us something about how, uh, the, how suitable the environment is for the, the different pathogens. And, um, and that's, uh, like I said, something we're, we're uh, trying to get some funding for to do. Um, another thing I got going on right now is uh, I'm looking at indoor spaces and uh, monitoring of indoor spaces. So one of the frustrating parts of uh, my doctoral research was that I could get uh, data pretty much on anywhere in the world. I can uh, tell you what the temperature is or the humidity is outside. Basically, there's tons of data sets. Um, telling us what's going on outside, but there's no data on what's going on inside. Um, and that's where most of us spend most of our days. Uh, in the developed world, we spend 90% of our time indoors, so it's very important to know what's going on inside. So I got a, a data set from uh, Matt Perzanowski, who's also at uh, Environmental Health Sciences here at uh, Mailman School of Public Health. Um, that was originally used for an asthma study uh, where they monitored uh, temperature and uh, humidity. And, uh, and uh, I am looking at how the outdoor temperature and humidity, and in this case it's again absolute humidity, um, relates to indoor absolute humidity. And eventually I'm also gonna look at temperature and relative humidity. Um, but you can see they track very well, but there is also a lot of uh, 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 variation between households. So in other words, there's a lot of, uh, some places are much drier than others. Um, in general, it's a little more humid indoors during the winter and a little drier indoors than outdoors during the winter, but there's also a lot of variability between households. So I'm gonna be looking at what determines this and why this occurs um, in the context of influenza, um, but also in the context of heat morbidity and mortality. Um, and another thing I, I found interesting, uh, if you look at that right graph there, is um, there's actually a lot of sub-daily variation of the indoor environment um, that is based on, um, basically it's, it's reacting to physical uh, activities inside. So um, this is actually, a, I, I did this on myself one day, just put a, put a monitor in my uh, shirt pocket and went home for the weekend. Um, 
This is me at the office. That's some very nice air conditioning, very cool, dry. This is me getting back home. Uh, I was kind of strapped for cash, didn't want to turn my air conditioner on. And uh, this is me like boiling water, I think, for spaghetti. Like at 11 o'clock at night on Friday, which is interesting and pathetic. But, uh, <laughs> and then this is uh, changes. So this is, uh, you can basically, this is basically a diary of my, my weekend. So there's different things going on, cooking and lunch, dinner, taking showers. You can actually see different activities going on inside. So this is actually very surprising that we actually change the indoor environment that, that much uh, uh, with our activities. So that's something else I'm going to be looking at um, as I go forward. Uh, but thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So my name is Kate Tully, and today I'll be talking about the effect of farm management on nitrogen balances. So um, I uh, primarily am a, a biogeochemist, which means that I study where nutrients are in ecosystems. So where they are, how they move around, what comes in and what goes out. And specifically, I focus on agricultural systems, which are the primary land use on the planet. And if we consider both crops as well as pastures, about 38% of the total land surface is in some form of agriculture. So why do we plant farms? Well, to produce food. And the primary way that we increase the amount of food that we can produce on a given plot of land is to apply fertilizers. Um, and unfortunately, there can be some pretty serious consequences to applying fertilizers in agricultural systems. So for example, not just within the agricultural system itself, but in terms of other ecosystems downstream. And so when we apply a lot of fertilizer and some of that runs off, it can cause eutrophication in streams, lakes, and estuaries. And this is a modus image of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is a really extreme, dramatic example of what can happen when we have these imbalances in agricultural systems in terms of their nutrients. And so, um, and especially in terms of nitrogen imbalances. And so several, uh, strategies have been proposed and implemented to try to deal with some of these uh, nutrient losses from agricultural systems. And so one of them is to use organic fertilizers in place of conventional fertilizers, which are mineral uh, fertilizers. And another is to intercrop with trees, um, which is also known as an agroforestry system. And so I looked at both of these strategies for my dissertation. And what I ultimately concluded was that planting trees is a more effective way to mitigate nitrogen leaching losses than switching your management strategy from a conventional mineral-based strategy to an organic uh, farming system. So my dissertation research was conducted in the Central Valley of Costa Rica in coffee cultivation systems. And broadly, I asked this question, how does management affect nutrient dynamics? And today I'm gonna to talk about specifically those nitrogen dynamics. So um, I asked the question, how, first, how does management affect nitrogen balances? So I'm gonna to talk to you about the, the model that I developed to estimate potential nitrogen leaching losses. And then I wanted to go out and measure what was actually happening in the field. So then I'll talk to you about the experiment that I designed to actually go out and measure uh, rates of nitrogen loss. And finally, we'll go back to this balance model and see how well it does in predicting and how we might improve it. So in its most basic form, a nitrogen balance or any nutrient balance is just the difference between inputs and outputs. So you'll see a few of these schematics. And primarily, the inputs that we're concerned with is through fertilizer, which can be either mineral fertilizers 
or in the case of an organic farm, uh, composts and manures. And so I mentioned that some of these farms include trees, and some of these trees are nitrogen fixers, which means that they can harness atmospheric nitrogen and put it into a form that's available to plants. So in this case, we consider that to be an input to the system as well. And of course, one of the major outputs is in the harvest. So these are freshly picked coffee berries, and they're very high in nitrogen content, and they leave the system after the farmer harvests them. And what I'm particularly interested in is leaching losses. So that's their, their gaseous losses, which, which go off um, from the soil surface. But what I'm interested in is, so nitrate is really mobile in water, and it can move down the soil column beyond the level where the, the tree roots are and essentially out of the system into groundwater um, sources. So uh, let's l first look at one of these models that I developed. So this is very busy, I know. <laughs> But I'm just going to sort of walk you through some of the key um, elements. So I'm going to move over here. So first here we have uh, an unshaded monoculture system. And this is coffee, full sun, no trees. And then we have, uh, which is amended with mineral fertilizers. So we have two agroforestry systems. In one, the farmers are applying mineral fertilizers. And in the other, they're applying manure, compost, organic fertilizers. So the first thing just to notice here is the huge amount of nitrogen that's being applied in these monoculture systems. So about three times as much as is applied in a mineral fertilized agroforest and about eight times as much as is being applied in an organic agroforest. Large inputs, large outputs both in nitrogen gas and also in the harvester yield. So we do see larger yields in these farms as well. And then down here at the bottom, we have what the nitrogen balance predicts will be lost through, the, through leaching from these monocultures. And so we see a large uh, potential loss there. So we'll look quickly at these agroforests. You'll notice there's another arrow going down. And that's our, from our trees, our nitrogen-fixing trees, that other source of nitrogen. But when I run the model, what I come up with is that whether or not a farmer is using mineral fertilizers or organic fertilizers, the potential leaching losses are pretty much the same in agroforestry systems. So to sum up, more loss from the monocultures and about similar rates of loss from these agroforests. So, is that really the case when we go out and measure nitrogen leaching? So these little guys are lysimeters, and you insert them into the soil surface at different depths, and they can collect water. And then you analyze that water for nitrogen. So I looked at both ammonium and nitrate in those water samples. OK, so here's our, our balance again. Down at the bottom, we have our predicted nitrogen leaching losses based on this input-output. And then these are the actual measurements in the field. So the first thing you'll notice is that the model underestimates the amount of nitrogen that's actually leaching from these systems, and especially from that monoculture. But the pattern is the same. So we see greater loss through leaching in the monocultures compared to our agroforests. OK, so, so what could we do potentially to improve this model? So I found this really nice relationship between the total above ground biomass, which is um, the, both the in the coffee plants and in the trees, and nitrogen leaching. So what you see is, is you have more vegetation, you have less nitrogen loss. And so if we can include some metric for the role that vegetation can play in mitigating uh, nitrogen losses, we can vastly improve our model. So, uh, so basically, the, the, whole, the study concludes that it's really important that you plant trees <laughs> on farms, and, uh, which is great, except that uh, the primary cause of deforestation in the tropics is removing trees for agriculture. <laughs> and uh, these regions are also home to some of the world's most impoverished people. So for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, agriculture makes up 61% of rural livelihoods, and 41% of people in those regions are living on less than a dollar a day. 
So you can see visually from this, from this map this convergence of deforestation, heavy reliance on agriculture, and extreme poverty. So, uh, and, and the way that we, we, we project to reduce uh, this is by improving the productivity of crops so that we reduce the pressures on existing forested landscapes as well as on, uh, as trying to reduce any, any continuing uh, land degradation. So the goal of the African Green Revolution is to reduce hunger and poverty and the main way that we project to do this is by applying these mineral fertilizers. And so this has been implemented in the Millennium Villages project and already we're starting to see that nitrogen fertilization rates have increased um, by over an order of magnitude and tree biomass has also increased by about 150 percent and that's because in the latter stages of implementation tree planting is promoted in the Millennium Villages project so this is great but we don't really know what the short-term or long-term effects of this will be on our nitrogen balances on our nutrient cycling so some models have been developed this is a figure from Generos Nizuguheba who's part of the tropical agriculture program and these are pretty Simple nutrient balances, their input and output balances. So on the top part of the figure here, what you'll see are farms. So these are different uh, Millennium Villages, and these are farms within those villages. And so what you'll notice is on the, the top part of the figure, we have farms where the amount of nitrogen that's being put into the system through fertilizers exceeds what's being taken out through the harvest. So it's possible that these farms will also leach more nitrogen compared to the ones down here. And these are farms where what's leaving in the harvest is exceeding what the farmers are actually applying to the farms in fertilizer. But that doesn't mean that they're not losing nitrogen. So that's where I come in. So I'll be <laughs> looking at uh, measuring nitrogen leaching in a lot of, in some of these farms. And, and the first way that I'm gonna do that is, is just looking in controlled uh, fertilizer trial settings to see what the relationship is between adding more fertilizer and nitrogen leaching losses. So we might have this nice linear relationship, although I doubt it, uh, or we might have some sort of exponential or asymptotic relationship and we, and we just don't know right now. There have only been three leaching studies in all of Africa ever, so, um, and, and none have been done on uh, fertilizers. So this will be a really interesting uh, question, whatever the answer turns out to be. And then the second part of the, the research will be to look at leaching losses on farms. So not just doing these controlled fertilizer setting trials, but also measuring leaching on farms where different management techniques are being employed. So, so maybe we look at the effect of, of agroforestry or long-term fertilization, and then also looking at the inherent capacity of the soil to retain nutrients. So different soils have different mechanisms, chemical mechanisms in place that can actually prevent nitrogen losses, and one of these is anion exchange capacity. And uh, so we'll be looking at some of those chemical uh, properties of the soil as well. So both uh, farm trial, both uh, fertilizer trials and some on-farm studies. And so with that, thank all the, the funding sources at the University of Virginia for my dissertation research and then my collaborators here at Columbia. And then I always thank my farmers <laughs> who I lived with for about six years. <laughs> so thanks very much.